All right, we're going to keep going. Thank you. Great. So everyone's had whatever caffeine, sugar, whatever you needed, and so hopefully you can uh, persevere till 11:30. We're we're in the down stretch here, so keep going. All right, how many use um, captioning um, uh, or have used captioning on your TV? What reasons have you used captioning on your TV? Too noisy, too many people talking in the house, right? And you wanted to hear what was going on, exactly, type of thing. Who do you think the number one user of captioning is in the United States? Elderly. Elderly. Any other ideas? <laughs> Bars and restaurants. And close behind them is health clubs. Because when you're on the treadmill and that noise is going, it's hard to hear the morning show, right? So they've got that going. Bars and restaurants, you've got a million games going on those, and the noises and things like that, so they turn the captioning on. Who do you think the second highest user is? I think I heard somebody say it. Oh, really? Nope. Non-English non -English speakers. Who use captioning to reinforce as they're learning English. They're using it as a, a tool to reinforce. Sometimes they can understand English better than they can um, read English, better than they can comprehend, vice versa. Third is... Elderly, but that is inclusive of people who are deaf or hard of hearing because just because I'm old doesn't necessarily mean I'm hard of hearing, but I may have a higher incidence of being hard of hearing because I am um, I'm old. My father's 86 years old, and he has not had good hearing for years, and um, he would never identify himself as being um, hard of hearing or deaf. He's just old. Okay, that's why he'll identify himself. And as technologies have come about, he gave up going to movies several years ago because um, my mother refused to, stop, uh, to continue to tell him everything that was going on in the movie because people get mad at her for talking during the movie. So they stopped going to movies. It wasn't a good scene. Um, and so um, I introduced my dad to technologies that are now available at movie theaters for um, assistive listening devices is what they're called. And you'll see the little symbol of um, uh, uh, AC. It's usually a large A with a C on it. Um, that is a sign usually on the, um, on the door or on the ticket uh, window or something of that nature. And it's a device you check out. And you use it and you put it over your, um, your ears and such. And it interfaces with your um, hearing aid. And it amplifies. It's individual amplification for that, for that individual. So I um, took him to a movie, and I introduced him to this. And he refused to use it because he said it's for people who are deaf. <laughs> Dad, that's you. Um, and so he did use it. He loved it. He loved it. And so um, he was very worried, though, about him using it. And then what about the person who really needed it, who came to the movie and wouldn't have it because he was using it? Um, so I had to kind of get him over that hump. But till to this day, when he goes to the movie theater, and he always leaves his name and where he's sitting, with the lady at the counter in case somebody comes who needs it and there's not one and he would be willing to give his up <laughs> to them. Because he insists that it's not for him, but he's using it. Um, but the, you know, these are the, the whole issue of that, you know, who uses this technology. A lot of technology was designed for um, individuals um, uh, who are deaf or hard of hearing, but it's used by a much broader audience you know, of um, individuals and people. So yes, captioning is something. You've got two kinds of captioning. You have closed captioning and open captioning. Closed captioning is what's on your TV, which means I can open it and close it. Open captioning is when captioning is always available. So sometimes you'll see a video where the captioning will run at the bottom of the screen. Public service announcements are required by law to be open captioned, et cetera. So you'll see the captioning appear. That's open captioned. Where the captioning actually appears, where I can turn it on and off, is closed caption. So captioning is something that's required when we show videos or have videos and things of that nature. So as Champaign County moves to do more things, because everyone's getting on board with the whole video craze and doing their own YouTube channels or doing their own videos and you know instructional or otherwise, you would have to make sure that those are accessible to your citizens who are deaf or hard of hearing. Um, as well. Uh, and so captioning is a key issue that is a part of doing that or having um, that. Uh, if you are showing videos during um, any training programs or things of that nature, they would need to, if you have people in the audience that are deaf or hard of hearing, they would need to be captioned um, for them. Uh, and so you have to think about that in the context of um, one of the types of auxiliary aids and services. 
We've talked about sign language. Again, sign language is its own language. Um, and uh, you know, there is um, Spanish sign language. There is Portuguese sign language. There is other types of sign language. So if you have individuals who are non-native English speakers who also happen to be deaf, they may be requesting a Spanish sign language interpreter. Okay, so that's, you know, just be aware that that is um, the, uh, uh, something different. Now, the state of Illinois um, licenses sign language interpreters. In order to work as a sign language interpreter in schools or in other um, uh, public arenas and things of that nature, you have to be a licensed sign language under our state law here in um, uh, Illinois, which would preclude me from grabbing somebody off of the street who happens to know finger sign and bring them in to be my sign language interpreter because they would not be licensed and thus they would not be qualified in the state of Illinois to be a sign language interpreter So um, for us. So that's something that, you know, is a Illinois, uh, many states have gone this route of uh, licensing sign language interpreters to ensure that people are using sign language interpreters who are qualified. There's a huge spectrum of sign language. There are individuals who are, have vo what we call native signs or home signs, lower educated individuals who have their own internal sign language to their family. You might have a whole family that everyone in the family is deaf. They develop their own internal um, language and such using much a, a cruder form of line, sign language. There's American sign language and there's also signed English and they are very different. And so people will be using those different types of communication. And so you may have somebody who requests, now American Sign Language is the typical sign language and the kind of default sign language that's used. But I can imagine in the courts, I can imagine in your police um, department, I can imagine your juvenile justice, I can imagine in a lot of your different scenarios that you would come across individuals who are probably not American Sign fluent and could be more in that home sign or in the more crude sign language area. And that's why you need to have sign language interpreters who are qualified. Your, science, your, your licensed sign language interpreter is qualified to read and interpret all of those different signs. Okay, But you may have to clarify and get information from people about that to know, make sure you're adequately providing um, sign language for that person um, and the sign language that they, that they actually need. It is not appropriate to use family members as sign language interpreters. Um, it, the ADA in the 2010 regulations specifically came, comes out and says that it is not appropriate to use family members as sign language interpreters. Um, you cannot verify that that family member is saying what you said. Like, think of your own context. If you have, let's say I'm a mother, uh, I'm the daughter of a mother, and um, I'm, in, I'm in your healthcare service or something like that nature, and the doctor's coming in and talk to me about my diagnosis with cancer. And I'm the daughter having to, to deliver this inspiration to my mother. What do you think I'm going to do? I'm going to soft pedal it a little bit. I'm probably not going to be as blunt or as forward or whatever with that. You have the liability to make sure that that person gets the information. That family member is not going to be reliable for you to do that. It's also not appropriate to use children ever as sign language interpreters. The only time that it even would be would be in a short situation, an emergency situation where no other option was available. That, that was the only way in emergency short term until you could get a qualified sign language interpreter to come. But very limited. Children should never be interpreting. I have a friend who grew up in a household where she was the only hearing person in her household. Her parents were both deaf and her brother was deaf and she was hearing. Um, she tells stories about being five years old and sign interpreting for her mother when the bill collectors came and other people came to the door and so that No five-year-old should be placed in that particular situation to be acting. That that's putting me in an adult situation where I should never be in an adult situation. It's not appropriate. Don't do it. Don't use, even if the person wants to use their family member or their friend as their sign language interpreter, the buck stops here with the Champaign County government to ensure that that person got effective communication. Which means even though I want to use my family member and let you need to assure that I had effective communication. Which means you're liable for whatever was communicated to me or not communicated to me. And that's why you need to look at using the, um, a qualified sign language interpreter for them. Computer aided real time transcription. Anybody been to a meeting or anything of that nature where you saw somebody off to the side uh, typing in a machine and people watching it on a screen? Words? The courts do this. They use CART um, for transcripts in the courts, et cetera. Um, uh, computer aided, they don't typically trans, uh, 
put it up on the screen or anything. But this is technology that's used by people who do not use sign language. That sign language is not their first language, um, but they don't have hearing. Or they might have a learning disability or something of that nature where um, they have auditory processing disorder and they need to read information versus being able to hear information being spoken. So this is where somebody is actually doing transcription real time of everything that is being said and it's either being projected on a screen or a laptop or an iPad or something in front of me and I'm reading and following along with it. Similar to captioning on TV but in real time. That's CART. Another type of accommodation that we might need to provide somebody. Um, Saying that I'm going to have a sign language interpreter when somebody doesn't use sign language is not effective communication. Not everybody who's deaf uses sign language. I may have not lost my hearing until I was 30. I developed full language. I'm not going to learn sign language. Just as I'm not going to become fluent in Spanish tomorrow or anything else. It's another language. So you have to be aware that there are different types of communication that are used. And um, CART is used by um, other than people who are um, deaf. It is used by individuals with um, learning disabilities as well. It's a, a little bit broader in um, who might be requesting those kinds of things. Other types of um, auxiliary aids and services for individuals who might be blind or low vision, things like large print, providing somebody with braille documents um, uh, instead of written um, uh, print document. Um, large print is defined by the um, uh, American uh, Council for the Blind as anything that is 18 point type or larger. Um, we would always recommend that you go larger versus smaller, 18 being the minimum. Um, if you are going to produce documents, say, in advance proactively in large print, we would recommend 22 to 24 point, point font. That can be, it's like that whole adage that the bigger it is, everybody can read it. The smaller it is, you're limiting who can read it. Your, fan, your documents don't have to be fancy. Um, you have a nice brochure that's all glossy in print. You don't have to produce a large print all glossy in print. You just have to produce the content that is in that brochure or that flyer or that whatever in large print. It can be on a plain white piece of paper. It doesn't have to have all of the fanciness to it. It's the content of the information that the person needs access to. Electronically, I need to make sure that individuals have information in electronic format if that's their requested preferred format. A lot of people who are blind or low vision use their own technologies to be able to use that, to read that information, which means they need it in a format that they can read, which means they might ask you to send them a Word document. They might ask you to send them a text-only document or something. Um, if you are using PDFs, which we know are rampant and pretty heavily used by anybody, what does PDF stand for? Come on. Portable digital format. Now you just learned something new there, right? PDF, portable digital format. So that is, it's, it, it, what we use PDF for is to maintain um, uh, formatting. You know, oftentimes used because you don't want somebody to change a document. Um, it reduces the size of a document. You know, it condenses images and things that should be a smaller file size. There are a lot of reasons that we use um, PDFs. But unless that PDF is accessible, that is not going to be an appropriate format to send to somebody who's blind or low vision. Their equipment won't be able to read it, and I'll talk about that um, in a minute. The most accessible formats are Word, um, HTML, which is a uh, um, web-based code uh, language, um, RTF. These are all options that you have when you save something in Word. Um, you can save, save it under Word. You can save something as an RTF. You can save it in different formats. Those are accessible um, uh, formats. Um, providing people with qualified readers, somebody to read the information to them. So if you're in a situation in an office where people have to fill out forms, and I may not be able to read that form, I may have to provide a reader for that person to read the form to them. Um, that could be somebody with a cognitive disability, a learning disability. It could be somebody who's blind who doesn't read. It could be somebody who is um, deaf who doesn't have good reading skill. There's a very low literacy rate among people who are deaf because they learn language differently than you and I do. So there's a high literacy rate. So depending on the complexity of your documents and the language used in your documents, it may be difficult for them to understand what you say. Um, the terminologies, the words that you use, et cetera, might be um, problematic and you would have to have somebody who would read for them. So this is something you would be need to be prepared to do. Yesterday I had somebody who we were talking and we were, they used the example in their office that they only have one or two staff people in their office at any one time. And they have a form that people are required to fill out. It's pretty long. It's 
It's about seven pages, and they're required to fill it out when they're in the office. They can't take it home, so it's something they have to do in-house. Well, that would be something that they would have to provide to somebody to read or assist that person in being able to fill out that form. Because of their low staffing, they may not be able to do it on demand. But they need to be prepared to do something like, can I schedule a meeting or an appointment or a time for you to come in when we know that we have a lower, um, uh, uh, maybe a higher staffing or a lower busy time where I could set aside time to be able to actually do that. That would be appropriate. That would be something that you would be able um, to do that would be an accommodation that you could actually provide for somebody. But you need to be prepared. So when you think about all the forms that you have, if somebody came in today and said, can I have that? I have my equipment with me. Can I have that form electronically so I can fill that out? How many of you would be prepared to be able to provide them that? Very good. One, two, OK. Others of you, if that's what you do, you need to be thinking about this. This is stuff you need to be prepared for to be able to, to do. Um, again, um, uh, people have speech. We talked about that they might use the TTY. They may use a communication board. Somebody may come in with their own communication board and you spell on the board for them or they spell for you um, to communicate. You need to be prepared and ready to do that. Um, again, the comfort level. Writing back and forth to somebody. Now, that shouldn't be um, uh, used for uh, legal information or technical information, but to write back and forth with somebody about hours or, or an address or something of that nature, that's perfectly okay to do. Verify that they understood what you write. You know, you understand, you know, how do I know if you understand what I said or what I write is that you asked me to repeat it back to me. If I can repeat it back correctly, I understood what you wrote or what you said. That's a good verification, just a simple check to make sure that we didn't make an assumption that you understand. Because the person might stand there and just shake their head. Because that's what they're used to doing when they go into the community. You want to verify that they actually understood. Because you have a responsibility for doing that. Um, people with cognitive disabilities, again, simplified language. You might um, have a form. Again, may have to explain the form. They may not understand the word. They may not understand the terminology sibling. You have a form that asks, do you have any siblings? I don't know what sibling. You ask me if I have a sister or brother, I can answer that. So I may need to simplify the questions or uh, assist that person in being able to do those kinds of things. Um, yeah, I might need to use gestures or to illustrate or show somebody how to do something or whatever. Um, repeating information, making sure I talk slowly, not like Robin is talking right now, because they will not be able to follow you. Um, allowing additional time for that person. They may take longer to complete the task. But again, patience. A variety of different people, a variety of different needs. Again, it's like, how can we adjust what we do to make sure that all of our citizens are served? Yes, it can be irritating. Sometimes it can be, you're on my schedule, you're interfering with my time, my break, my whatever. Again, we're about customer service. We're about serving the citizens. We may need to make adjustments or be prepared to make those adjustments. So when am I required to do this? Basically in everything that you do. Every meeting, every event, every interaction that you have with the public, this is... Our, these things are requirements. It doesn't, it doesn't change. Um, it's uh, everything that we distribute, every document that we have. Um, uh, if it's a temporary document we're only using for one time, or if it's a document that we're using on a long-term basis, they all, it all applies to those kinds of things. If it's just a meeting, um, a one-time meeting, or if it's a monthly meeting, it applies. If it's only with three people or 20 people, it applies. If anyone that's part of that group has a communication barrier, oral or written, you have an obligation, depending on what you're doing as to how you're going to respond to those particular issues. Now, the guide that I was talking about, the handbook that we referred to earlier, that has, again, information in it. It has resources in it as to how do you go about doing these kinds of things. And we're going to talk a little bit about um, how the public goes about doing some of these things um, with you uh, in, in a few minutes. So key to start with here is knowing who your ADA coordinators are. Without her putting up that website, any of you here know who your ADA coordinator is for your individual area? Good. So it's on the public website because the public also knows who the ADA coordinator is because this is on the public side of your county website. So if I'm a person with a disability and I want to know who I'm going to contact in um, the uh, nursing home or in the, the uh, um, jail or the sheriff's office or wherever, I'm going to go and I'm going to be able to find out. And now I've got that person's name, I've got their phone number, and I've got their email. So you want to know that also. If somebody asks you who the ADA coordinator is, even if you have to go to the website, know that it's on the website, that it's there. Have that information and be able to refer people accordingly 
um, to that individual. And then for those of you that are, that it's outside of, your work is outside of any one of those designated areas, again, Tammy, raise your hand back there in the back. There's Tammy. Um, she is that the uh, catch-all, I guess, uh, overall um, ADA coordinator outside of those other areas. So the way that Champaign County has done it, um, all municipalities do it a little bit differently, is that they have um, designated a overall ADA coordinator and then they have the ADA coordinators in your different units, which have different functions and, and um, need to have that direct access to an ADA coordinator. So go ahead, you can close that. So know who that person is. All right, so notice to the public. This should be something that is included on brochures and um, things of that nature. So how does somebody know if um, and how to request an accommodation, right? So how do I know? It's, it's not your responsibility to second guess that somebody needs an accommodation. It's my responsibility as the person with a disability to identify that I need an accommodation. So if I'm gonna be attending a meeting or I'm gonna be attending or coming and doing something and I know that I'm gonna have trouble reading the print of the documents or I'm gonna need a sign language interpreter for communication, I need to go and um, to request that. So in the um, uh, guide, the, the handbook, there is um, information in there about, you, you have your notice. Um, I can't remember if that's a, is that a hyperlink? Yeah. That's um, to, yeah, there we go. So on that public page, there is a notice that is, you can see across the bar, it's got home, notice, grievance procedure, and then feedback um, reporting uh, and reporting accessible information. This is the notice to the public that the public has related to how Champaign is going to be um, uh, accommodating or um, what they're doing to comply um, with the ADA. It talks about your communication, talks about your employment, that you modify policies and procedures. It talks about the fact that if you need, don't scroll too far, if you need, uh, let's see, um, this one right here. Nope, go down one more. Where's the 48 hours? There we go, thank you. So if anyone needs a um, accommodation, that the, the kind of policy that the, I guess the, the line in the sand to some degree that Champaign County has determined is 48 hours advance notice. Okay. Now, for some of you, depending on what you're doing, you might need more notice than that, um, depending on, on what the activity is. So it should be something that you look at in, 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 uh, in context of the, of the event or the, or the activity, et cetera. For some of you, 48 now, oh, notice, notice is not going to work. So for example, the sheriff's department, and they arrest somebody, and somebody who's deaf, and they're going to you know, be in arraignment or, or whatever in an immediate scenario, 48 hours is going to be problematic. I can't give you 40 hours because I didn't know 48 hours ago I was going to do something bad and get arrested. So they're going to have shorter time frame obligations and things of that nature. Just as in medical, that situation. I don't know when I was going to have a crisis or a situation of that nature and I might have that. So 48 hours is the rule of thumb for meetings, um, uh, events, and things of that nature. But there will be those exceptions for those other kinds of activities that happen um, or that, that we're engaged in. So if there was a, um, a natural disaster or something of that nature, obviously those time frames would be out the door. You would have to be dealing with something different um, in relationship. Uh, to those kinds of things. So you can go ahead and, and close that. All right. So um, to, you need to, when you're looking at, is that you want to include the language. So when you put in the notice, so if you're having a meeting or an event or something of that nature, you want to have a notice on there that says if you need an accommodation, you need to request the accommodation within 48 hours, whatever your time frame is um, to do that. Who th they, should they uh, uh, contact? And you do have a online option for being able to request those. So go ahead and um, do that hyperlink there. This is on, again, the public side of the website. And you can see that. You go ahead and take the link to the feedback and requesting accommodation. There's a form that you fill out. Okay. And the form will then ask you the different questions. Now, this is about... Um, the website, so if there is a, um, they're asking questions if there's a problem with the website or there's something that people are having from an accessibility perspective from the website. And then they are asking, go ahead down. Whoops. Scroll down. There we go. So um, go back up. 
So if you're requesting access, acceptable information, this is what you need. So this is what you would use to request. So you can direct people to this form to request, and then that will be directed to the, the appropriate person um, with the person's information. You may need to do follow-up with that individual to make sure uh, they're doing it. So for example, if the person um, I've seen where people have um, filled out these forms, and they'll say, I need an electronic format. And that's what they'll put. Well, I don't know what that means for you. It doesn't mean you need it in Word. Do you need it in whatever? So you may have to do a follow-up with that person. Some people may be very specific and say, I need it in Word format, or I need it in text format, or whatever. Um, in, in that case, you know, you can pretty much provide it to them in that, in that format. I need it in large print. Hmm, what do you mean by large print? What print do you need? Do you need 18? Do you need 24? Do you need whatever? So you may have to go back and follow up with that individual in, in those regards. But this is where the contact and the, um, the public can make a request for specific accommodations for events or activities or things of that nature. So there is the online option, but you still want to provide them with other options. Not everybody has access to the internet. And not everybody has timely access to the internet. So even though I can say, oh, you can go to the Champaign County Library or, or public library and you know, use the public internet to uh, request one. Well, I may not be able to get to the library for two days, and now I'm going to miss my 48-hour request time period, et cetera. So that's why you have to make sure that it's not the only way that somebody requests or that you take requests for these things, but you provide them a phone number, email address, et cetera, to make those requests as well. So these notices go back to the slide. Thank you. Um, these notices need to be something that you start to include on a regular basis, um, and then you have to make sure your staff are um, prepared to respond. I can tell you I've been on the other end where somebody will tell me, I've said, I don't believe that, and I'll call the number, and I'll make the request as if I'm that person, and then the person on the other end will say, we don't do that. Well, that's because nobody trained the person answering the phone about what they do. So it's always your lowest denominator in these scenarios and situations that you want to make sure people are aware that these are policies, these are what we do, and that whoever's answering the phone or that you've directed them to is able to respond and act accordingly to these, these responses. Okay. Um, any questions about the request for provision of reasonable accommodations, um, sign language, real-time captioning, all of those things? Any of that? Yeah. Um, yeah, you can. Well, I want to hope that FEMA's document is accessible. Um, FEMA, Federal Emergency Management, is um, covered by the federal requirements. Um, Section 508 of the Rehab Act, which is a whole separate requirement for them for accessible electronic information, which includes their documents and things of that nature. Um, it's one of those things that I would do is, one, Either whoever's given it to you, ask them if they can verify for you if it's, if it's accessible, or if you can check it to see if it's accessible before you disseminate it. Um, there are ways to check a document for accessibility, um, but that's something that I would do before I disseminate it. If it's not um, accessible, of course, go back to the source and say, I need an accessible format. If you can't, is there something you can do to extrapolate that text to make it accessible for somebody that you're disseminating it to? It is always, always much harder to retrofit a document for accessibility than it is to create the document accessible. And it all goes back to what we did when we first opened Word, or we first opened Excel, or we first opened PowerPoint, and started to create our document. Because we are all lousy at this. Most of us learned how to use Office products by trial and error. Most of us got it given to us Figure it out. Maybe somebody showed you a few things. Maybe you went to a short course or whatever. But we all tend to have developed our own bad habits in how we do things and, and such. And oftentimes, that will affect the accessibility of the documents. Because document accessibility for a person who's blind or who is um, low vision, who's using assistive technology, is all based on the structure of the document and the reading order of the document. So while you and I visually see something on a document, and we see it maybe going left to right, if that document was not created such so that the layout of that actually has it going left to right, if I was to tab through it, then my screen reader is not going to read it left to right. It might read it up and down instead, depending on how I created it. If I put a text box in or I did whatever I did in creating that document, I put a table in or whatever I did. 
So it has a lot to do what you see visually is not what somebody who's blind using assistive technology sees with their technology. So there is a whole skill, there's a whole area around creating accessible documents. And I know that that's something Tammy and I talked about, um, that there's um, more efforts and more resources being looked at here at the county to help people to assure that they are doing that, um, uh, you know, through training and through providing the right software and things of that nature to do that. Because think about it, a lot of us create PDF by taking the document that we created or that was given to us over to the copy machine and copying it as a PDF and sending it electronically to my inbox. All you did is just took a picture of a piece of paper. There's nothing renderable on that document. What I mean by renderable, a document when it's in its pure form or it's in its regular form has the paper and then it has what is been imprinted on that paper, when it's an image, they're together. When it is appropriately, text is not, lays on top, figuratively. Lays on top of that paper, which means that it can be extrapolated. That's why you can highlight certain documents, is because it can be extracted. Do you ever try to highlight an image that was a photograph, like of an article that you copied, you can't highlight it because it, it won't render for you. The text won't. That screen reader needs that text to be renderable so it can be picked up off that page by their technology and read. And then read in the correct order. Now, low tech ways that you can check to see if a document is at least got the right reading order and has renderable text, is if you open a document in Adobe Reader, I always recommend you have the most current version of Adobe Reader, and under the um, view option, you have an option for read out loud. Has anybody ever used the read out loud option in Adobe Reader? There you go, if you have. It will read the document to you. If the document does not have renderable text, it will not read. It'll also read to you so you can hear whether or not the text makes sense. Because it's going to read it as it's structured on the page. It's not going to read it as how you see it on the page. So if you did not structure it correctly, let's say that you put headings across, let's say you had three columns, but you didn't create it in tables. You created it by your own tabbing or whatever. Okay, which we do all the time. How many of us do that, right? Okay. So you got three columns, and then you put some stuff underneath that column, each of those columns, and you did the same thing. You wrote your line, you tabbed to the next, you wrote your line, tabbed the next, you wrote your line, tabbed the next. What's going to happen is that that screen reader is going to read it across like you created it, and it's not going to read it this column or this column or this column, which is how I visually see it, but the screen reader doesn't read it that way. So the text is going to make no sense to me using my screen reader because it's going to read it jarbled. It's going to jump around in the text. It's not going to read it as you intended it to be viewed. Does that make sense? It's hard to, to describe those things. But if, if you ever were with somebody who had screen reader, or just try it on Read Out Loud one time, and you'll see that you, it's like, whoa, how did it get there? That's not, you know, that's not how I'm reading it when I'm reading it across. It doesn't make any sense. But that is, that's, a, that's kind of a, a cheater or, or a, a, an easy way, low-tech way, to check to see something is um, in that way. So, Modifying policies and, um, and, and making modifications to what you do is something you also have to do under um, the ADA. So things like no pets policies. You know, uh, many of your buildings, or most of your buildings probably have, um, you know, no pets are allowed. Well, a service animal is not a pet. So I have to have an exception for a service animal. Um, uh, we use things for identification. You must show a driver's license or something to show your identification. We need to accept other kinds of identification, like a state ID or something else, because not everybody drives who has a disability. So I have to look at those kinds of things. So that's making a modification in my um, practices and to do things. Um, uh, I may need to um, 
uh, make a change. Let's say I have a situation where people wait in line in my office, and we have a queuing process or whatever. But I have somebody with a disability who can't wait in line. They can't stand in that line. We need to look at, can we provide a chair off to the side? The person's queued by a uh, you know, placeholder of some type or whatever. They sit over to the side, and when their number comes up, then they come in to be able to be served, you know, kind of a thing. That's an accommodation. We're making a modification. Everybody else stands in line whether you like it or not. But because of my disability, I can't, so you're going to make that modification in how you do it. Or you allow people with medical or other kinds of issues to be served. You have a process by which they can bypass that process and be served. Like the Secretary of State's office, as an example, has a process by which they do that for people who, are, um, who have disabilities and such. So making that kind of modification or change. Again, it's what works for you and your organization. You have to think about those kinds of things. What do you do and what might need to be modified? Just because we've always done it a certain way and because it keeps it nice and orderly for us does not mean we don't have an obligation to look at how we can modify it specifically for that circumstance. Not for everybody, but for that circumstance and situation. Um, again, uh, being, uh, having somebody do it differently than everybody else. So um, if everybody else is required to fill out the form themselves, but I can't because I can't scribe, I can't write on my own, I may have to allow somebody to bring somebody in to help them fill it out or whatever, or, if, or um, we assist them in filling it out if that is consistent with the business or the activity that, that we do. I'm not required to make a modification in doing something that would result in a fundamental alteration to the nature of program or activity. So yesterday we had a question. Um, somebody brought up an issue of uh, they worked in um, the courts. And in their particular situation, they, when people come to their office for information, the, um, they're not allowed to write things down for people. People are required to write it down for themselves because of the fact that if there's an error, that, that they've made their own error, not the, the um, being, come, come back and say that the staff person made the error or whatever else it might be. Um, and so now you have somebody who um, is um, deaf and they um, can't hear you. And all they need is a number of some type or an address or, or whatever they need type of thing. Um, now you've got to look at how are you going to meet the need of that person because I can't sign it to them because I'm not fluent in sign language. My other option would be writing it down, but we can't write things down. So how are we going to address that particular issue? I'm not required to bring somebody else in with me. You can't require that I bring somebody else in with me. So how are we, can we modify the policy for writing down, have it verified, or do something else? How can we get over that particular issue when we have those unique circumstances in place? Is it always hard, fast, or are there exceptions or, or areas that you have to do that? So that's something that has to be, to be um, explored and, and looked at um, individually as, as you do things. And there will always be those areas that will be um, harder to problem solve. But go back to the issue of what is the purpose? The purpose is I have to make sure that my communication is as effective with that person as it is with everybody else. So if it's a verbal communication, then I have to figure out how I'm going to make sure that that verbal communication is accessible. Is it going to be worth me to hire a sign language interpreter to come in for that five minutes, ten minutes, or whatever that that person is getting that information for me? I don't know. You have to figure that out. But it is those things that you have to look at. What are the options and how would you make those modifications unless it would be a fundamental alteration to the program? Questions about any of that? I'm going to move on to service animals. Um, service animals are very controversial. There's a whole bunch of issues around service animals. Up until 2010, a service animal could be anything. It could be a pig. It could be a ferret. It could be a rabbit. It could be a snake. Um, it could really be anything under the ADA. And under Illinois law, it was um, always just, it was defined as a dog under Illinois law. But uh, ADA trumped the Illinois law because it would provide greater access. In 2010, the ADA was amended to define a service animal as only a domestic dog. Now, this is not to be confused with other laws. There is the Fair Housing Act, which allows somebody to have an emotional support animal in their um, housing with them. And it does not define an emotional support animal as any specific type or breed of animal. So it could be that ferret, monkey, pig, snake, whatever, in housing. Air Carrier Access Act also allows emotional support animals on their airplanes. They are not specific to breed either. In fact, some of you may have seen the recent 
about a week ago, there was a service turkey <laughs> that flew internationally in its own seat um, that raised quite a bit. It, it made Facebook because some passenger took a picture of it sitting in its seat and it like went viral. Um, but anyway, um, I have to say that the, um, the service Turkey has caused the FAA to look and re-examine their, um, their policies. And so they have uh, stated publicly that they're going to be revisiting their emotional support and uh, service animal policy. But under the ADA, it is only a domestic dog and it is only a service animal. Emotional support animals are not recognized under the ADA. So I said emotional support animals are recognized in housing, and they're recognized by FAA for flight for airlines. They are not recognized under the ADA, okay? Which includes Amtrak and some other um, uh, buses, uh, like Greyhound and things of that nature as well. Um, public transportation uh, vehicles and things of that nature. What is the difference between an emotional support dog and a service animal? A service animal is a dog that has been trained to perform a specific service or services. An emotional support animal is an animal that I use that makes me feel better by its proximity to me or being with me. Should not be confused with a psychiatric service dog. Psychiatric service dogs provide a service. They're trained to provide a service. So for example, take somebody who has PTSD. That service dog may be trained to recognize certain triggers for that person and take that person out of the situation and or provide uh, grounding comfort for that person when that trigger goes off to redirect them when that trigger. That's an example. Somebody who has major clinical depression may have a service animal that is trained to not let them lay down other than at night. That when they go to lay down or to sleep, the dog is trained to not, to pull on them, to not let them do that. Okay? When somebody has high um, anxiety issues and starts to show um, uh, fidgeting or, or tre uh, tremor or um, uh, ticks or things of that nature, the dog is trained to go and either put a paw on that person or sit on that person or put their arms on the person to, to, to ground or comfort that person. So there's a difference between a service animal and an emotional support animal. That service animal is trained to do a specific service. Service animals are trained to um, uh, identify when people are having um, a uh, diabetic reaction, a uh, glycemic reaction. They're trained to, to smell the sensitive seizures, to sense when somebody, the chemical, um, changes in a person's body, they can trigger for seizures. Hearing dogs, um, to pick things up, to pull ch wheelchairs, to uh, um, open doors. I mean, all kinds of things, all kinds of services uh, for them. But the difference is it's trained to do a service. There is one exception to a dog under the ADA, and that's a miniature horse. The ADA does says entities need to look at whether they can modify their policies to allow somebody to have a miniature horse. Now, you're not going to see a lot of miniature horses in Champaign County. Um, we don't have many miniature horses in, ge in general in Illinois. We have no miniature horse training programs in Illinois. Um, there are miniature horse training programs in Iowa nearby and in Ohio, but not in Illinois itself. Someone might choose a miniature horse over a dog for different reasons. Religious reasons might be one. There are some religions that dogs are not um, favorably viewed and not allowed in homes and, and other settings and things, whereas a horse would be. Um, a um, horse gives a very different stance than a dog does. Now, I'm talking about a miniature horse. I'm not just talking about a horse that hasn't grown up yet. All right, I'm talking about a breed. It's a miniature horse. If you, they, they are not any bigger than a large golden retriever or a German shepherd or a bull mastiff or, you know, other dogs. Um, so, again, it's a specific breed. Um, but they have a different stance. And so somebody who might use a service animal for assistance with ambulation might find a service horse to be better than a dog for that particular person, especially if that person has a lot of gait-related issues and things, providing more stability. A horse lives a lot longer than a dog. A, dog. a horse's useful life is longer than a dog. A service dog you only get about five to six years out of because as dogs age, they can't provide the same services and such, depending on the type of service that they 
do. So that might be another reason. So there's different reasons why I might have them. What that's important for you is that you have to understand what your policies are here and um, uh, on how and you would respond to somebody bringing these into your um, establishments. There are only two permissible inquiries in relationship to a service animal. One is, is that service animal needed because of a disability? But you cannot ask what the disability is. You can only ask if it's needed because of a disability. And the second is, what is the service or services that that dog or animal provides? I cannot ask you to demonstrate them. You know, can you please have a seizure so I can see what your dog does? Um, you cannot do that. But you can ask them what the services that it does provide. Okay, so that's the limitations. And again, we have seen some abuse um, of people with service animals that, you know, um, people with disabilities. Any law will be abused. Any law will be stretched. There, that, you know, um, there is a lot of concern. There's a lot of things going on. You know, people bringing frou-frou little um, whatever, riding on the back of their wheelchair into, you know, everywhere they want to go. What service does that dog provide? That might be a seizure dog. That might be a hearing dog. That might be, you know, so you have to be careful not to make assumptions just because of the breed of the dog that they're using. But the key here is that the dog has to be a trained service animal. Trained service animals don't poop and pee anywhere that they want to. Trained service animals don't bark, don't run around uncontrolled. If you see that behavior, you have every right to deny that dog access to your facilities or your buildings. You cannot deny the person with a disability, but you can deny the dog. That's because it is not a trained service animal if it's doing those things. Those are key signs of not having a trained service animal. So again, aware that this is an issue. This is something that will not go away. It's becoming more, um, more and more frequent we're seeing it. Um, there is a very good document that just came out in July of 2015 um, by the Department of Justice on their website, ADA.gov, which is most commonly asked questions about service animals, which answers a lot of the questions that come up on a regular basis. So for example, if I'm an entity, am I required to allow this, this individual, let's say I'm a swimming pool, am I required to allow the person to bring their service animal into the swimming pool? No. Service animals swim different than humans. You, you know, they do different things in water. You know, uh, bladder control, even though kids pee too, um, there's different issues. A dog swimming around humans when the dog's paddling and got its peed out, feet out and its claws and things of that nature, or not claws, yeah, whatever those are. Um, uh, you know, that's a, that's a problem. There's a safety issue. That's legitimate. Can I, can, am I required to allow a service animal to be in the grocery cart? Absolutely not. It is not a cart for your dog. It is a cart for groceries. And even though I can talk about gross things I've seen in grocery carts, the rule of thumb is that dogs are not allowed in grocery carts. And I would not be required under the ADA to allow you to put your service animal in the grocery cart. So there are some good documents. There's a lot of those kinds of things on that document. So if you have questions, I would just refer you to that particular document. It's, it's, a, it's a good resource for you. No, there, are no, there is no certified. Um, under the ADA, uh, there is no nationally certified. There are companies that do, like Paws for Cause, Seeing Eye Dogs International, et cetera, who do issue a certification to people who have gone through their training program, and they will carry it in their wallet. That is not a recognizable certification from the ADA. You can't require that somebody have that. You also cannot require that they have a vest on or anything of that nature. They're not required to have a vest. They're required to be under the control of the individual, which means least harnessed, et cetera, harnessed, or et cetera. Um, but you might have somebody whose dog is not leashed because they can't control the leash because they have no arms. That dog still has to be in their control, which means that it's not wandering around, walking around, that is in voice control or their control um, of that individual. You're not going to see that much. It's very rare that you see that, but you will occasionally see that situation. Again, it goes back to it being a trained service animal. But you cannot require. You know, if you go on to Amazon, you can buy a service dog vest. If you go on to Amazon, you can buy a parking record for the state of Illinois even. That looks just like the one that's issued by the state of Illinois. 
Okay? There's all kinds of things that people do. There's a lot of fraud that is out there that does not make it. So the certification, no, I can train my own service animal. I don't have to be trained there. Again, there is not a national certification program. This is a problem that the industry has. And the industry is starting to start to address this particular issue and look to national standards and things of that nature for certification. And once that does that, I can imagine the Department of Justice potentially adopting something like that. But until that time, there's no way for them to regulate who would be certified or who would not be certified for a service animal situation. So we're down the road for that. It still raises a lot of problems and issues. Yes? So just to clarify, somebody who's PTSD. Yes. And, and they claim that they have the service, service animals. Due to their disability, and you can ask them what service does a dog provide. Comfort is not a service. Okay? That has to be trained to provide a service. So again, that it, it recognizes triggers and pulls me away or does something of that nature. Just make me feel better? No. It's got to be able to provide a service. That's an emotional support animal being used by somebody with PTSD or other kinds of psychiatric disabilities. So making me feel better, no. Um, that uh, could, uh, helps me when I, in, when I become anxious and it you know, puts its paw on me, or something to redirect me, that is a service. That's trained to do a service. You clarify the service the dog does, but not the disability. Correct. Right. I can't ask you what disability you have. I can yet say, is this dog needed due to disability? What is the service or services that it provides? If the person says emotional support, that's not it. That's not a um, service. Can you ask for clarification on that? Sure. So yeah. Like you said, you know, okay, can I answer the question? Emotional support. You know, you can't. You, or not inappropriately, but yeah. incorrectly, they didn't inform you correctly. Yeah, you can, you say, can ask questions about the service. Is there a physical can't. service that the dog provides? Right, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. In that sense. Mm -hmm. That yeah, would be fine. Just don't can't ask what the disability is, and you can't ask me to demonstrate it. So you have to decide. Where this comes down to, you have to decide how far you go with it. Right? And you have to decide at what level you want your staff to be going to do this. Because you're putting them in a judgment position. So you have to decide how important is this issue in the scheme of all issues. So for example, if the dog's disruptive, you want them to be dealing with that particular issue. But if you're going to have every dog that comes in be questioned because the person's not in a wheelchair or an obvious disability, you've got to decide what you're going to do on that. That's a tough one for anybody. It's a private business or anybody in that case. Let me also clarify that, of course, you also have other situations where, you know, um, a service animal in the nursing home, you know, that would have to be looked at from a policy procedural issue. Service animal in jail, you know, things of that nature. Um, service animal when I'm being arrested and transported. What happens to the service animal? What goes on with there? All of those things have to be addressed and looked at in the relationship that you might have with somebody in the public with their service animal. No different than my wheelchair, you know? What are you going to do if I'm, if, you, if I'm arrested? You can't just leave my wheelchair sitting on the corner of 9th Street. You can't leave my service dog sitting on the corner of 9th Street. You got to deal with it. It's part of me and who I am. So those practices and policies need to be clarified and worked through and your agencies and your staff educated about them as to how do we respond to these things because we have required to do so. And we've seen some case law develop around these particular issues with um, correctional, um, with paramedics, uh, you know, other areas. Um, emergency, you know, um, having policies that allow service animals to be with um, an emergency sheltering situation. You know, Katrina put big highlights on that one. And there was all kinds of litigation stuff that went around on that particular issue of separating people from their service animals in, those, in emergency situations. So. No, no. Emotional support is only housing, and that would be residential housing, not even hotels or short term. So like Champaign-Urbana, the, the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana has to deal with it in the dormitories. You know, there's a lot of those kinds of things that are different. All right, surcharges. I cannot charge a additional surcharge or put a surcharge on anything for somebody. So if somebody needs a sign language interpreter, 
um, I can't charge them they can't, that they, they pay the cost of that sign language interpreter. If somebody needs a, a document in large print um, and you know, it costs me to print it, um, where well, sure, we, you know, we, don't, we, don't, we can't charge somebody for, maybe it was seven pages. We can't charge them for, you know, for seven pages or whatever. Um, if somebody uh, needs a document and you have a fee schedule where you provide the first five pages at no cost, and every page thereafter pays 15 cents, whatever uh, uh, is in a FOIA or whatever kinds of requests you have. The fact that I've requested it in large print is going to mean it's going to mean more papers. You can only charge me what you would charge somebody in regular print. So if the document is seven pages in regular print but it's 24 pages in large print, you can only charge me for the seven pages in regular print. You cannot put a surcharge on my need for the access to the large print. I'm not required to provide personal services or devices. You're not required to provide me the wheelchair, um, eyeglasses, or things that somebody might need. Um, of course, you know, I, I know that in some of your settings, you might have a wheelchair at the entrance for people who might need you know, um, transportation stuff. That is something you're doing as a customer service issue. That's not a requirement under the ADA. We can always do things as a customer service. We've got elderly population. We have people who are a health clinic or something, people coming in who might need that service. Of course, we're going to you know, do those kinds of things. That's a customer service. That's a uh, how we provide our services. That's not an ADA requirement, okay? Um, I'm not required to provide them their personal services unless I would provide them um, to others. So an example of that might be, um, let's say, um, uh, whether you have this or not, a daycare program and you have a, a cutoff limit where you would only do uh, diapering and things for kids up to the age of two or, or three or something of nature. But you have a six-year-old who is in the program who's still in diapers because of their Down syndrome and they're not potty controlled or, uh, controlled or whatever. You say, well, we won't diaper that person because they're over the age of six years old. Well, you're diapering under the age of two years old of that program, so you're already providing that service. You've placed the age limit on it. It's due to the disability that they need the diapering. You would have to modify your policy to do that because you're providing it for others. If you have a program where you don't do any and everybody has to be potty trained to participate in the program, um, and you don't do any of that for anybody, then you would not be required to do it for a person with a disability. But because you're already doing it, that's an artificial age scenario that you've placed in there. You're already providing the service. You would need to modify for that. Just briefly talk about facility um, access to understand the fact that the ADA, when it went into effect in 1992, that was kind of the drawing the line in the sand as it related to building facility access. You had those buildings that existed at that time that were already built. And so what I needed to do was go in and modify those buildings to increase the accessibility to the maximum extent that I could using the applicable accessibility guidelines that were in place. There were a set of 1991 accessibility standards. Those were replaced in 2010 with a new set of accessibility standards. So today, any work that we do now, we look to the 2010 accessibility standards. The state of Illinois has had an accessibility code since 1986. So technically, that was before the ADA. So anything that was built after 1986 should have been in compliance with the state of Illinois' accessibility code. So when we start to look at what's wrong with the building, we go back to when it was built. What code should have been fo followed at the time that it was built? And then we look at having to fix to bring it up to that point. And then anything additional might be needed. It may or may not be able to be feasible depending on the nature. There could be historic issues. There could be technical feasibility issues, et cetera. But going back to my previous comments about program access, we have to make sure our programs are accessible. So we might have a second floor that doesn't have an elevator. We can't hold programs in the public up on that second floor because there wouldn't be vertical access for people with disabilities. So we could move that program to a first floor location as an alternative or an option to putting an elevator in that building. Eventually, we might put the elevator in because we need that space and we have other issues or other reasons to do that. So it applies to new construction. Everything that's newly built must comply. Alterations, anything altered after 92 must comply. Existing facilities are required to be brought up to either physical accessibility or the program access issue kicks in. You can't use program access for new facilities. Oh, well, we're not going to put an elevator in this building, so we'll just move everything that we're going to do to the public out. No. When you build new, everything has to be accessible. It's like a line in the sand. Everything moving forward, and then gradually, as we remodel old things, we'll increase the accessibility of those buildings and facilities as we do those remodeling and such. Temporary events are covered as well. That means anything that we do on a temporary basis has the same requirements as those things we do on a permanent basis. So if we put up temporary health fairs or 
two temporary uh, festivals or events that we sponsor in whole or part, we have obligations under the ADA as the county. So even if we're a co-sponsor, we have got obligations. It may not be our event, but we're co-sponsoring it. We've got obligations to make sure. So the same things apply from a physical access perspective. Even, even if it's temporary, if I'm going to put up some porta potties, then I have to have accessible porta potties. And that means I have to have an accessible route to those porta potties, which means I don't put the porta potties in the field with no accessible route to them. And I see that all the time. I'll see a nice accessible toilet out in the middle of a field. Great, nobody can get there. But you got it, so check that one off. But you didn't do it right. So you've got to be looking at those kinds of things. Temporary parking. Maybe we've obliterated the parking because the event is going to take place on the parking lot or whatever else it might be. But we're still providing parking over in this field or something of that nature nearby. We need to make sure we have accessible parking available as well. It might be temporary. We might be using yellow tape to, to mark it or having a staff person there to mark it or whatever. But we still have to make sure that that is available. So our obligations extend to temporary events the same as they do for our permanent, um, as far as our properties and things of that nature. Um, again, same things for policies and procedures, same things for communication apply as well for temporary events. I've alluded to tech, the technology side of things. Obviously, our website is where we're doing our business now. We've shown you a few places that the public is accessing you for information about the ADA, but we know that we're moving more and more things to our web for the ways to get information out to the public. We're printing less things and putting it up on the web instead for people to print or, or download or, or do whatever or get their information or get their forms or things of that nature, um, pay their different taxes and bills and things of that nature online. We have to make sure that people have equal access to that. Even if we can say, well, if you can't, then you can come when we're open between 8 and 5 Monday through Friday and do it. That's not equivalent access. If you're giving the general public 24-7 access to engage in that activity or that activity, it is not equivalent to tell me I can come between the hours of 8 and 5 Monday through Friday to do the same thing. That also means that I have to go someplace, I have to get transportation, et cetera, where I can sit at home in my pajamas, click on it, and do it. I've got to be able to give the same access. That means I have to have full accessibility of our website. So you saw the area where people could give feedback because, of course, as you're evolving into a more accessible environment, you want to know where there are problems. And the problems will be from you. The structure of the website's accessibility is the structure, just as this building is the structure. It's what you start to put on the web page that starts to become the issue of whether it's accessible. So when we start putting images up on the website, we put pictures or, or, or graphics or um, logos or things of that nature. Are they tagged appropriately so somebody in a screen reader knows that that is a picture of X or the logo of whatever organization or whatever else it is. Otherwise, it shows up as just a blank or an image for them. They have no idea what it is. If it was important enough to you, put it up there to make it look pretty for everybody else, and you need to tell me what it is. I have a right to know, and I need to know that. Also, I don't know. You're, you're interfering with my navigation of the page. I don't know what's on the page. Then if all I'm hitting is all these image kinds of things. Um, all my interactive things, my fillable forms and such, I need to make sure that those are accessible. Are all of the uh, boxes labeled? What do you want in them? I may see name next to it, but is the actual box labeled so that when I mouse over it, it says name. So I know that that's what you want me to put in there, or address, or whatever else it may be. So when I create fillable forms, are they accessible fillable forms? Are my interactions with credit card or all of those kinds of things, are they accessible? If I'm using a third party payer to do that, or a third party enterprise to do that, is it an accessible enterprise? So that somebody can complete the transaction using their credit card or whatever else it is. Can I download um, forms, and when I download them, can I um, manipulate them and use them? All of these things. We're seeing more and more that entities are starting to go. If you haven't done a lot of it yet, you probably will. Is kiosk, where we put kiosks out into the community to be able to engage and do business um, uh, and such that um, you know, might be pay bills or do things of that nature um, in, at remote sites or different areas um, as well. Get starting to replace people in some situations. Are those accessible? So all of these things come into play when we're purchasing them, when we're designing them, when we're deciding what we're going to use or what we're going to have. All of this has to incorporate accessibility. And the more that you do from the front end of that, you will avoid a lot of cost and headache and um, uh, uh, time by 
thinking about it in, in your planning process. Make sure that accessibility is part of the planning. When you're planning to do something, if you're planning to do some kind of new launch of documents or development of stuff or redoing existing ones, make sure that accessibility is part of that. If you're uh, outsourcing it or if you're doing it internally, that whoever's responsible for it is taking into consideration accessibility when they do it. Because again, you're going to double do the work if you have to go back and make it accessible after the fact. Again, it's your obligation to have web-based information. Um, any questions about any of that before I move on to this last section um, before that we end about employee issues? Okay, I know. Everybody's going, okay, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, okay. All right. So you have, um, you're all employees. And as I said earlier in my presentation, the county is covered because it has one or more employees for non-discrimination in its employment practices for people with disabilities. So each one of you, whether you have a disability right now or you could have one in the future, this pertains to you. So the ADA says that an individual who's qualified to do the job with or without reasonable accommodation cannot be discriminated against on the basis of their disability in the job that they hold or a job that they desire to hold. So that could be a new applicant or it could be you wanting a promotion or to move to another area within county government. Okay. So in order to do that, and this may pertain to you now or it could pertain to you later, there's a process in place by which you have to go through to request a reasonable accommodation. It is not your supervisor or manager's responsibility to second guess that you might need an accommodation. It is your responsibility to request the accommodation. Now, you can request an accommodation verbally. There's nothing that precludes you from doing that. In fact, having a conversation is a very good place to start in this process, but the county has a process in place by which they want to document the request for the accommodation and go through that documentation process for record keeping purposes. And this is also to your benefit because you want to be documenting these things too because we all know what happens in he said, she said conversations, right? You had a conversation, yes, so you thought you all understood it. Later on, there's a problem and it comes back and goes, well, you never said that. You know, that's not what you said. You said something else. We have no way to verify it because it was a conversation that we had. And it's always never a problem until it's a problem. So there's a reason for having policies and practices like this in place for everyone's benefit and for everyone's protection. So on your intranet site, which is the page, I think you can go and now hyperlink to the actual page. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so you have an area for ADA forms. Now, this is where the um, uh, handbook, and can you just show them where that link is for the handbook? That's where the handbook link that we showed earlier is. So it's under the same area on the intranet. And then you have these two other forms. One is a request for reasonable accommodation form. So we're gonna go ahead and go open that form. So this is a form that's gonna ask you very specific questions about your job, the job that you have. It's gonna ask you what the limitations are related to the job. So go ahead and, um, yep, asking you questions like, is it time sensitive or not? Is this something that is, needs immediate you know, action or is this something that you know, we can look at in, you know, over a course of time or something? So if there's something that's happening tomorrow, um, you know, in your job or something of that you're versus uh, an uh, area that needs to be addressed or looked at. Asking you what are the limitations um, that interfere with your ability to do the job. Now, you have no responsibility to give them the entire story of your disability. This is specific to as it relates to limitations that impact your ability to do a specific function of your job. Okay? So this is what you do. So what is it that I'm that it, that it's um, interfering with that I'm not or I'm having difficulty um, being able to do? Are there any privileges of employment that you're having difficulty doing? Believe it or not, parking is not a right; it's a privilege. There's nothing that says the employer has to provide you with parking. It is a privilege that there's a parking lot here and that you don't have to fend on the city streets out here to find a parking space two blocks away and walk to your office. It's a privilege. People think it's a right. It's not. It's a privilege. So if I need accessible parking, maybe I have arthritis, maybe I have heart disease, maybe I have some, asthma, something of that nature, maybe cold weather. In fact, it could be a seasonal issue versus a, you know, a year-round issue. Whatever it is, that would be where you would make those kinds of things do that. Now, I would say you needed access to the health club because that was a benefit, but I doubt that's a benefit here. So I won't even include that one um, as an example. Um, Let's see, 
do you, how will the accommodation assist you? Describe how and what it would uh, be able to do. Um, and then any information that you think that would be um, pertinent to evaluating your particular request. So this might be um, information related to your, the environment that you work in or something that would be helpful in making a consideration of, um, of uh, the, the scenario itself. Then you are to sign that and you are to um, uh, return that form um, to your uh, ADA coordinator um, uh, and um, they will then process it. This will be then um, processed through the channels here within um, the HR department and such to, to look at these particular issues. Um, the, typically what goes along with this then is request for medical information. It is your responsibility to substantiate that you need the accommodation that you're requesting for based on or due to a disability related. Oops, I think, did I do that? I'll stop. Okay, so they have a, the uh, county has a right to get medical information from you to substantiate the need for the accommodation. Again, this is not your entire medical history. This is only as it would relate to the specific accommodation for which you are requesting. So you may have many different medical related issues that are not related or pertinent to the particular request that you are making. You're only required to provide documentation as it relates to the request that you're making. And that documentation has to be from a qualified medical professional. So to um, uh, be going to your um, uh, podiatrist for your mental health diagnosis would not be appropriate. Even though your podiatrist might be doing some acupuncture for stress or something of that nature, it's not an appropriate medical professional for that particular issue. So you have to have it be coming from an appropriate medical professional. But complete this form. What's really critical and key in this issue is to submit this information in a timely manner. Because once you have made, what you basically have done is you've made the request and identified that there is a barrier in the work arena for you. You have basically initiated what we call the reasonable accommodation process. And that is a required process under the ADA that's an interactive process between the employer and the employee. But that means both parties need to cooperate in it. It's not one-sided. Both have responsibilities in this process. I'm, my responsibility is to identify as the individual with a disability what my limitations are. I might not have the answer. I'm not required to know exactly what I need, but I need to identify where I'm having the barrier. It'll be an interactive process for us to work on what might be options or solutions to that or looking to some medical documentation or some medical assistance in that. So for example, if I know I'm having difficulty due to my back with my chair in my office, but I don't know exactly what it is. I don't know if it's the lumbar support. I don't know if it's the leg supports. I don't know exactly. I'm not required to have all of those details. What I'm required to do is identify what the barrier is and then we'll go through the process of identifying what might be the options for the solution. There are typically more than one answer to each thing. I might have a preferred requested accommodation. I may not receive my preferred requested accommodation. I only have a right to an effective accommodation. So I might want a specific widget or gadget, I might, but there might be an alternative to that. I may want a specific time schedule. It may not work in the work environment. There may be an alternative to that offered. I may not get my preferred. The issue is I need to be given an effective as long as it's reasonable. So all of this process is part of the employment process that you will go through for this. So this is something to keep in the back of your head if you're a supervisor manager. I'm having a, a session this afternoon. We're going to talk more in depth with some of those folks about this issue. But if as an employee, this is something that pertains to you um, or somebody else you know. You can refer them if they haven't, you know, don't remember this was available or something of that nature. Um, go through the process. Not every request will be granted. Not every request may be found, be found to be founded, um, et cetera. But this is the process that you need to go to to start that, that um, area and start to look at those particular issues. Okay? All right. Um, go ahead to the next. Those are the forms. Keep going. So there are some resources available for you out there for more information. The Department of Justice is the entity that enforces the Title II requirements under the ADA. They have a website um, that has great information on it that you might be interested in perusing. That's where that service animal document I referred to. But there's also things on website accessibility and stuff on there as well. They have a very nice toolkit um, of everything from um, emergency management to all different areas of customer service also that you might be interested in taking a look at. 
Um, from an architectural uh, accessibility standpoint, the U.S. Access Board would be your federal agency that's responsible for the architectural requirements under the ADA. That's where you go to. Again, their website is rich with information as well. And then, oops, I guess, um, yeah, there we go. Um, our office is always available to answer questions. You do not have to tell us who you are. We're open between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. We have an 800 number. We also have an email. Um, you can just ask us, it could be a question about your job or your, what you're doing in your work. It could be answered personally or whatever. Again, you don't have to disclose who you are. It's anonymous. Um, but we're more than happy to work through scenarios with you, give you additional resources and referrals and things that nature. And then, of course, for the overall Champaign County, you've got Tammy. She's wave her hand once again. Um, she is your overall um, ADA coordinator um, for the, for the uh, um, county. And then, again, you have your individual ADA coordinators who may just refer you to, to uh, Tammy. But, um, again, Think about those resources. Look to that guide, that handbook that you have. Um, ask the questions. There's never a dumb question when it comes to this stuff. You're not expected to have all the answers. Work it through. Think it out. You may make some initial mistakes. I'd rather make mistakes and get it right than to continue to make mistakes and end up with another complaint or lawsuit or something of that nature as well. So thank you very much for your time today, and have a good rest of your day.